morning, Hope Church. It's great to see you this morning. And again, as Pastor Mark already mentioned, whether you're joining us here in the room, down in the Family Life Center, up at North Campus, or really from anywhere else online today, it's great to have all of you together for this, uh, this time together in God's Word this morning. As we continue in our summer series that we've called Fruitful, if you've been with us for the last number of weeks, you know that we are heading through all summer long Paul's description of the fruit of the Spirit that's found in Galatians 5. And this morning, we'll be moving into one of the last couple of fruits. We're getting near the tail end of this series here at this point. But before we get to that, to get us started, I want to ask you a simple question this morning. It's that question that's at the top of your outline there this morning, if you got one on your way in. And that question is this, what's your favorite fruit? What is your favorite fruit? We've been talking about spiritual fruit all summer long, so I felt it'd be appropriate to begin our message today by asking, what are some of your favorite non spiritual fruits. And so if you don't mind at the outset here, just take a second in that space on your outline if you've got one and jot down one or two of your just top favorite fruits that you absolutely love. And as I considered that question uh, in preparation for the message today, I started wondering, you know, what in general are some of our favorite fruits? When it comes to just people in general across the country, what are those fruits that rise to the top that everybody seems to really like? And so I took to the internet, went to look for some information, some data, and actually ended up finding a pretty good study um, from the USDA that was conducted in 2022. In 2022, they gathered some data about per capita consumption of fresh fruit in the US measured in pounds. And so basically, this study measured how much fruit was consumed per person in the US and ranked these fruits based on consumption. And this graph, it's actually from the study, shows it's a little hard to read, But you can see that bananas were the clear winner here at the top with the average person consuming almost 27 pounds of bananas in a year, which is quite a bit. Um, It's a larger number than I expected. Uh, Then not surprisingly, apples came in at number two with the average person consuming just under 16 pounds of apples in a year. And now just by a quick show of hands, how many of you wrote down apples or bananas as one of your favorite Okay, a decent amount. It seems like that stat tracks in, in this room as well. I wasn't surprised by those two being at the top. I was a little bit surprised by number three, though, as being avocados. And I was surprised by that one because if I'm totally honest, I didn't realize that avocados were considered a fruit. Um, but I looked that up as well, and apparently biologically the way they're made up, they are considered to be a fruit. So those were the top three. You can see as it goes on down, we have grapes, pineapples, oranges, and so on. Hopefully one of your favorites uh, made it up there. But as I looked at this list, I also started to wonder about the opposite of this question. I started to opposite or to wonder, you know, what are the fruits that in general most of us dislike or don't like as much? So I went looking for information on that question as well. And I found a lot of different stuff. It's much less scientific than than this study. I will say that. The best resource that I found was uh, a a pretty good sized poll that was done by a a recipe and a food website that's called Mashed. And what they did was they polled people via YouTube and Facebook and basically asked them, what is the worst fruit ever? What is your least favorite fruit? And they compiled all of that into an article, which I read. And according to the people in that poll, Figs were ranked as the absolute worst fruit ever. Most people said they disliked figs because of the kind of mushy or slimy texture of them. Uh, One commenter on the poll even said that chewing on the seeds in a fig feels a little bit like eating crushed glass. And so not a lot of love uh, for figs on this poll, which I wasn't surprised by, honestly. I don't know that I've ever met a person that said, you know what sounds really good right now? Like, I wish I just had a big bowl of figs. To, to be able to eat. If that's you, that's great, but I have never met that person. So it wasn't a shock to me, but I was a little bit surprised, to be honest, to find that in this poll, watermelon was also listed as one of the least favorite fruits out there. And again, I, I am in full agreement on the figs thing. I am not a big fan of figs, but I almost took this one a little bit personally because I love a good watermelon. But uh, much to my dismay, Many people commented on the texture of watermelon that they just couldn't deal with the texture of it and claimed that it didn't have a whole lot of flavor. Um, One of the commenters said that a good watermelon has the same consistency as a bad apple, which as much as I love watermelon, it's a pretty accurate statement, I think. Um, Another person also described watermelon as barely fruit-flavored wet sand, 
And uh, so you can see, uh, just from these two different studies, it's obvious that we all have favorite fruits and we all have others that we don't really like at all. We have others that we would rather leave out of the fruit salad, if you will. And I bring this up this morning because, as I mentioned at the outset, we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit all summer long here at Hope Church. And when you look at the fruits that are listed there, all of them seem like important and desirable traits of a spirit-filled person. We have things like love, the fact that God is love and we're called to love the way that he does. Joy, that the joy of the Lord is our strength, that he gives us joy that lasts in every season and circumstance. Peace, we have this peaceful demeanor, this peaceful state that doesn't always make sense, that transcends understanding, and so on and so forth. But as we get near the end, there's a fruit that at first glance can make us wonder, does that really belong? Is that really such a big deal? Do I really need that fruit present in my life? And that fruit's the one that we're going to be looking at today. It's the the fruit of gentleness. Among all the other important fruits that we find in Galatians 5, gentleness seems kind of optional, like it could possibly be left out of the rest of the fruit salad, because because if I'm loving, if I'm joyful, if I'm peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, self-controlled, all those things, does it really matter if I'm also gentle? And gentleness isn't really something that's celebrated in our culture, to be honest. We want certain things to be gentle in our lives. We want our, our sweet and loving grandmother to be gentle. We want our dentist to be gentle, amen? Yes, that's a very important thing. Uh, We want our our dish soap to be tough on grease, but soft and gentle on our hands. They're things that we do want to be gentle, but we don't want the defensive line on our favorite football team to be considered as gentle. We often don't want the people that lead us in various uh, arenas or capacities to be described as gentle. We want them to be decisive and bold and to take action. And honestly, I think if we're, we're honest, we don't want gentleness to be a word that's associated with us. We don't want to appear weak. We don't want it to seem like people can simply walk all over us. And so again, gentleness feels like the odd fruit out. It feels easy to overlook or to ignore. And honestly, these are some of the thoughts that came to mind when I found that I would be talking about gentleness today. You know, the series just kind of works out the way it does, and we We get whatever fruit was in the right order. And I honestly was like, what am I going to say for 30 minutes about gentleness? Why couldn't I have got one of the others that had a little more meat to it, like love or faithfulness or something like that? But the Holy Spirit, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, included gentleness in this list. And in doing so, the Spirit is saying to us, when you receive me into your life, there will be evidence that I live within you. And one of those proofs, one of those markers that I'm working in your life is that you will continually grow in gentleness. And so despite my initial lack of enthusiasm about gentleness, I got to work studying what it looks like and why it's such an essential part of being a Christ follower. And as I studied, my appreciation for the New Testament concept of gentleness really began to grow, and I began to recognize just how much I actually need to grow in this area of gentleness. It's funny how sermons work out that way. And the more I studied, the more I kind of began to understand why we have a lot of hesitation when it comes to the word gentleness, why we sort of distance ourselves from it and don't want to be seen as gentle in our culture. And I think a lot of it stems from a true misunderstanding of what gentleness actually means and doesn't mean in a biblical sense. And so this morning, I want to help us arrive at a better understanding of this idea of gentleness. And I think the best way is to begin by looking at the original word that's translated as gentleness here in Galatians 5. I know we've read it a lot this summer. Hopefully you've got it memorized by the time we get through this series and read this passage almost every single week. But the main passage we're studying in this series is Galatians 5, 22 and following. It reads this way. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So this letter to the Galatians from the Apostle Paul, it was originally written in Greek. And the Greek word that's translated as gentleness here is a pretty interesting one. It's the word proutes, and it comes from the root word praus. So proutes and praus, these are the two that we're looking at and studying this morning. And in most modern translations, you'll see it translated here in Galatians 5 and elsewhere 
as gentleness. But if you're familiar with the King James Version of the Bible, you'll more often see it translated there as the word meekness. And throughout the New Testament, um, you'll see proutes and prous translated in a variety of different ways. Sometimes they're translated as gentleness, like we see here, but other times, even in modern translations, the best word is meek or meekness. You can also find it translated as and closely associated with the concept of humility. And even though all of these words are similar, they all have their own specific definition. They're all different in certain ways. And so even just a brief look at these Greek words shows us that this term gentleness is a multifaceted one that's really kind of hard to nail down and fully capture with a single English word. And so this morning, we're going to look at a few different passages that use this word and this concept to help us arrive at a better, more robust idea of what it truly means to bear the fruit of gentleness. Three pictures, if you will, from the life of Jesus that illustrate these different meanings of these, these words that are translated as gentleness. And the first passage we're going to look at today is Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. And in this first passage, we'll see that gentleness is strength under control. The one aspect of gentleness is strength under control. So this passage is kind of in the middle of the book of Matthew, and it comes right after Jesus first sends out the 12 to go and preach the good news to the people of Israel. And shortly after sending them out, he shares these likely familiar words in a teaching moment. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So here when Jesus says, I am gentle, the word used is that same root word of the one in Galatians 5 that we're talking about. It's the word prouse. And so here Jesus describes himself as being this exact type of gentle and gentleness that we are discussing here this morning. And his use of the word prous alongside the concept of a yoke here is pretty interesting and I think significant. In those days, a yoke was a large piece of wood that was attached to the shoulders and the back of a pack animal, and it allowed that animal to effectively pull and move whatever it was attached to. It also allowed its master to effectively guide and lead that animal to complete whatever task was at hand. Because of this, the yoke was often used as a metaphor for sitting under the teaching or the leadership or the guidance of someone else. And it's interesting to see this metaphor alongside the word praus, because apparently praus was a word that was often used by the Greeks in this time period to refer to a pack animal that had been broken or trained. So just imagine for a moment a wild ox or a bull that's been broken and tamed and trained and now uses its raw power and strength to complete useful work for its master. Or picture a wild horse that used to buck and kick and throw people off that now has a small bit in its mouth that's able to walk and run and jump, all at the command of the one who holds the reins. All of that wild energy has been brought under control and now stands ready to be channeled into useful work under the guidance of a master. And so what Jesus is saying in this passage that he is gentle, and that in coming to earth as both God and man, he surrendered his strength, all of his divine power to the will of his father. And he says, hey, come over here, take this yoke, let me guide and lead you and I'll show you how to rest in a life that's surrendered to God's will. And I wanted to look at this passage today to begin to help address some of our misconceptions about gentleness. I think a better understanding of this word and this concept helps us to see that gentleness does not mean a lack of strength. Gentleness does not mean weakness. No one would describe a tamed pack animal as weak. It has the same amount of strength as before, but now it's learned to temper its strength in order to accomplish the will of its master. In the same way, when we're called to bear the fruit of gentleness, we're called to have strength that's under the control of another, that's been surrendered to our master. We're called to carry ourselves with balance. We're called to respond to people who are difficult and abrasive in a measured way, a, a response that's neither excessive nor passive. And in doing so, we will display the fruit of gentleness. And if that sounds really difficult, that's because it is. As we've reiterated throughout this entire series, all of these, including gentleness, are fruits of the Spirit. We can't manufacture this type of gentleness. We can't manufacture any of these types of fruits 
on our own, and we only begin to grow in them as we sit under the yoke of Jesus' teaching and learn from his example by the power of the Spirit. So in this first passage, we've seen that gentleness involves strength under control. As we move into another passage this morning, we'll get another picture of gentleness and see that gentleness is leveraging power for others. Gentleness is leveraging power for others. For this passage, we'll fast forward just a little bit into Matthew chapter 21. In this chapter, Jesus has just started the last week or so of his life. He's entered the city of Jerusalem riding on the back of a donkey. He's received the welcome of a king, complete with people throwing their cloaks, palm branches at his feet, yelling Hosanna in the highest. It's the, the events we remember on Palm Sunday. And after coming into the city, Jesus heads straight to the temple where an interesting scene starts to unfold. And we'll pick up this story at Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer and you are making it a den of robbers. So once he got to Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts. And in this time period, the outer court of the temple had become a marketplace of sorts. All of the vendors there sold goods with a religious bent to them. And many of the items were things that were needed when people came to offer sacrifices to God. They sold things like wine and oil, but they also sold things like sacrificial animals and the doves that are mentioned here. The other gospel writers also mention things like sheep and oxen that would have been for sale. And this idea started out kind of as a solution to a problem because a lot of people would make pilgrimages from far off lands to come and worship at the temple in Jerusalem. And it wasn't always practical or even possible for them to travel those long distances with these animals and large amounts of supplies and things like that that were needed. So they needed a local place to be able to purchase things once they got to Jerusalem. And while that sounds pretty harmless, by the time Jesus got on the scene, this marketplace had morphed into something a little bit less innocent. At this time, the high priest was a man by the name of Annas. He was a corrupt leader who used his position in the temple for an opportunity to make a little bit of extra money. And so he built up this marketplace by offering merchants the opportunity to pay him for the exclusive right to sell certain animals or supplies at the temple. And on top of that, he would take a portion of all the profits that they made from each of these vendors back for himself. On top of that, the chief priests also would tend to ensure that animals not purchased from these vendors would be deemed unfit for sacrifice in the temple. And so it was basically impossible for people to bring their own animals to sacrifice at the temple, if they wanted to offer an animal sacrifice, the only option was to pay these inflated prices for animals. And one of the commentators I read even said that the animals cost 10 times or so more at the temple than they did elsewhere. A modern day example um, that's a little bit less serious would be going to buy food or drinks at an amusement park or a concert or a sporting event or something like that. You're going to be there long enough to probably get hungry or thirsty, but you can't bring anything else in with you so they can charge you $6 or so for a bottle of water because you have no other options. Annas also had a similar system in place for the exchange of currency. Many people, again, would come from far off lands and have money that wasn't accepted. They would need it exchanged, and so they would have to pay rates of 25% or more sometimes just to exchange their money and all of these fees, all of these high prices simply served to line the pockets of Annas and the other chief priests who were willing to do his bidding. And when you understand the background of this marketplace, you see why Jesus called the temple a den of robbers in this situation. Those who were charged with carrying out the duties at the temple have begun taking advantage of people who are simply attempting to come and worship God. They were skimming off a portion of the top of the offerings and sacrifices that people were attempting to bring to God. And in the process, they were turning the temple into something that it was never meant to be. And so Jesus saw all of these things as he entered the temple that day. He saw the greed of the chief priests and the officials. He saw the people who were being taken advantage of in the name of his father, and he was angry. There's no other way to describe it. He was angry. He had seen enough, so he did something about it. He drove out the merchants and the animals. He overturned the tables of the money changers, likely making a huge mess and a huge scene in the process. And I bring this passage up this morning. I wanted to look at it today because when I read this, it doesn't sound gentle to me. 
it doesn't sound gentle in the way that we tend to understand gentleness in our day and age. I mean, isn't this the same Jesus who just said, I am gentle and humble in heart? And if so, why is he now being so aggressive and borderline violent with these people? Once again, I think the answer lies in our misunderstanding of the concept of gentleness. In our culture, I think we often equate gentleness with passivity, with a willingness to overlook things just to keep the peace or to make everyone happy. And there were probably plenty of people in Jesus' day who took that approach. Everyone knew what was going on at the temple. Everyone knew it was corrupt. It wasn't this secret or hidden thing. But very few had the power to really do anything about it. And those that did have the power were unwilling because they were profiting from the corruption. But Jesus, filled with compassion, was willing to step in. He leveraged his status as a Jew. He leveraged his status as a rabbi. He ultimately leveraged his status as the son of the living God sent to represent the Father to help those who were being oppressed and exploited. And that's what made this show of force a gentle one. It wasn't for himself, but it was for the cause of God and for the good of others. And on top of that, he didn't lose control. He channeled the exact amount of energy, the exact amount of force that was needed to address the situation, not too much and not too little. Dan Doriani, a writer for the Gospel Coalition, sums this idea up really well. When he writes, we see then that the gentle can be assertive, but they do not assert themselves. We can be strong and assertive yet gentle if we leverage power not to assert self, but to promote the cause of God or the needy. Jesus was forceful, even confrontational, yet gentle because he used his power for others, and the same holds for us. So again, in this passage, Jesus helps us to get a better idea of what it means to be gentle. Gentleness doesn't mean passivity or apathy. It doesn't mean turning a blind eye to injustice or evil in order to be nice. Instead, it means leveraging whatever power or position we've been given to serve God and to further the cause of Christ in the world. So far, Jesus has helped us see that gentleness involves strength under control. It involves leveraging power for others. And in our final passage this morning, he'll help us see that gentleness also involves humbly submitting to God's will. So far this morning, we've mainly talked about gentleness in relation to other people, that we're supposed to keep our strength under control when we deal with others, that we're supposed to leverage our strength to help other people. But at this point, we'll start to see that gentleness is also something that's meant to be directed toward God. And this is where those ideas of meekness and humility really start to come in. Because when I say that we're meant to be gentle toward God, I don't mean that we're supposed to be easy with him or to make sure we don't deal too harshly with him or anything like that, but rather that we're meant to humble ourselves before him and to put his desires, his plan, and his will above our own. That's really what meekness of spirit is all about. One of the resources I often use when preparing for a message is a website called Blue Letter Bible. It's a great resource that helps search for Greek terms and see where they all apply in the, in the scriptures and things like that. And their, their page about the Greek word prous that we're discussing this morning had a, a, a powerful definition of meekness that I think is really helpful. And it reads this way. Meekness toward God is that disposition of spirit in which we accept his dealings with us as good and therefore without disputing or resisting. Gentleness or meekness is the opposite to self-assertiveness and self-interest. It stems from trust in God's goodness and control over the situation. The gentle person is not occupied with self at all. And I love that definition because when we think of meekness, I think sometimes the picture that comes to mind is that of a pushover. We think of those who just let people walk all over them, people who want to make everyone happy, so they just kind of stuff their own feelings and opinions and never speak up for themselves. But that's simply not biblical meekness. Biblical meekness is a desire to please God and to consider his opinion of us before any others, to humble ourselves before him, to trust that he knows best. And once again, Jesus modeled this type of meekness perfectly for us. Throughout his life, people had all kinds of plans they wanted Jesus to carry out. People wanted to make him king by force at certain times, but that wasn't God's plan, so he didn't go along with it. He resisted. At different times, his disciples and followers wanted him to approach his ministry differently, to be more public, to do more miracles, things like that, but that wasn't God's plan, so he didn't do it. 
Satan tempted him with power, tried to sway him away from the path to the cross, but that wasn't part of God's plan, so he resisted the temptation. In the garden, when he was being arrested, Peter wanted him to fight back, but that wasn't, again, part of what God wanted for his life. So he continued to go along with what was unfolding. While he was on the cross, people mocked him and said, if you're the Messiah, just come down. Help us see it. We'll believe it. Just come down and save yourself. But he stayed. And he stayed in place because he was humbly living to please his father above anyone else. There are a lot of passages we could look at that illustrate Jesus' meekness and his humility before his father, but I don't think any of them captured as well or as beautifully as Paul does in Philippians chapter 2, where he writes, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus was in very nature God. He was God in flesh, but he lived as a servant. He obeyed God even to the point of death on a cross, and he did so because he trusted the plan of his Father. He believed that God was good, and that even in his suffering, it would bring about the good plans of his Father. That's what it means to be meek. That's what meekness looks like. That's what it means to be gentle toward God. It means that we trust him, that we bow in humility before him. So this morning, Jesus has helped us get a better idea of what gentleness really looks like. We've seen that it's not weakness, but it's controlled strength. It's not passivity, but leveraging our strength and power on behalf of others. It's not being a pushover or letting other people walk all over us, but humbly submitting to God's will, his plan, his opinion above all. And as we've studied this fruit in depth, my hope is that your opinion of gentleness has shifted a little bit. To use our opening illustration, I hope it's gone from fig territory down at the bottom of the list and moved up to those upper, uh, those higher spots that are occupied by the, the apples, the bananas, the favorite fruits. Because I know that was certainly the case for me. Because as I continued to study gentleness over the past number of weeks, I really came to realize and recognize that gentleness is a key indicator that the Spirit is at work in your life. If you boil everything down that we've looked at this morning, you can't help but conclude that gentleness is a key indicator that the Spirit is working in your life. And that's because the things that make up the fruit of gentleness don't come naturally or easily to us at all. An animal doesn't tame or break itself. It can't do that. That's simply not possible. Instead, a trainer with the right knowledge, with the right plan, with the right experience comes in and gets the animal to that point. In the same way, the Spirit's intervention is required to bring us to this controlled, level-headed state of gentleness. We don't naturally choose to leverage our power and strength for the sake of others, but the Spirit molds us, shapes our conscience, softens our heart toward the needs of the oppressed and the overlooked in our world. We naturally pursue what we think is best for us, or we follow the opinions and the whims of other people, but the Spirit gives us faith and humility to trust that God's plans and promises are better. In short, if you want to know if the Spirit is working in your life, ask yourself, am I gentle? Am I a person that could be described as gentle? Does my life reflect this idea of biblical gentleness that Jesus modeled for us so well? And as we begin to close this morning, I want to consider just a handful of questions together that will help us determine how present this fruit is in our life at the moment, a sort of gentleness self-assessment if you will, to help us apply what we've talked about. The first couple questions will deal with gentleness toward others. The last one will deal with our meekness, our humility before God. So first question to consider this morning is, do you tend to overreact? Do you tend to overreact when people are difficult, when all of your buttons are being pushed, when tensions are running high? Do you tend to overreact? Do you lose control? Do you unload on people? Or do you remain level-headed and steady? 
Another way to ask this question is, have you allowed the spirit to break you? Have you allowed him to smooth out your edges and bring your anger, your passion, your energy under his control so that it can be channeled into good and useful things for his kingdom? And please understand, when I ask this question, I'm not asking if you never get upset or angry or worked up. Because as we've seen, those who are gentle can and should be forceful or confrontational at times, but it's all about remaining under the control of the Spirit when those times come. When I think about this question for myself, my kids immediately come to mind. I think there was a time in my journey as a dad when I thought the goal was to never be angry or stern with my kids, that I was being a good dad if I never raised my voice or didn't hand down consequences that would make them really upset. But believe it or not, the experience of raising three kids has changed my opinion slightly. <laughs> because they can be difficult, right? Many of you know that. They make poor choices. They sometimes need to know that their consequences have actions. They need to learn to not repeat the same behaviors over and over. So instead of asking, do I never get stern with them, I've shifted to asking, am I applying the right amount of sternness or discipline in this situation? Does the punishment fit the crime, so to speak? And am I keeping myself in check? Am I remaining level and steady and in control as I seek to guide them? And that's the kind of question I'm challenging us to consider today. When the rubber meets the road, do you lose control? Or do you allow the spirit to help you remain steady enough to apply the right amount of force or pressure in a given situation? The second question is kind of the opposite, the flip side of this one. Do you tend to underreact? The Greek philosopher Aristotle had a pretty profound way of defining prous or gentleness. He defined it as the middle ground between wrathfulness, which is getting angry when you shouldn't, and wrathlessness, which is not getting angry when you should. And I think it's easy for us to focus on the first part of that. It's easy to look at a given week or a given day and think, I overreacted there. I shouldn't have gotten so angry with my wife or my kids or my coworkers at that point. But I don't think we focus on or think about the other side of this question very much. I don't think we tend to ask ourselves, what did I underreact to today? And I think if we answer this question honestly, there's a lot that we underreact to in our world today. How many times have we heard about natural disasters or extreme poverty all around our world and simply not been moved by it, had no reaction? How many times have we heard heartbreaking and devastating statistics about human trafficking or slavery that still exists in our world today and not allowed a little bit of holy anger to build up to move us into action, to get involved in fighting back? How many times have we seen a classmate or a coworker being mistreated but didn't step in and get involved because we just didn't want to deal with it? We didn't want to get tied up in the situation. How many times have we heard about people all around our world or even here in our own community who have never heard the good news of Christ, who have never gotten to experience the peace, the love, the forgiveness, the gift of eternal life that comes from knowing him and simply thought, oh well, I hope someone else gets involved and takes care of that. I think we tend to overreact in a lot of areas, but if we're honest with ourselves, we underreact a whole lot more. But gentleness requires action. It requires leveraging what we've been given for the good of others. So be willing to step in. Don't be someone who underreacts. And last but not least, when it comes to our meekness, our humility toward God, the third question is this. Do you ask why or what? Do you ask why or what? I have a friend who's currently walking through a really difficult and an unexpected health journey. He's received a decent amount of bad news lately, but I've been so amazed at his faith, at his attitude in the midst of it. When he first received the news of what was going on, he sent around an email to some, some people just to kind of say, here's what's happening and here's how you can pray. And as I was reading that email, I was struck by a quote. He said, sometimes there just are not any words, but what I've come to lean on are these words from Luis Palau, we are not to ask why, but what. Not why is this happening, but what does God want to accomplish through this? And then he, he said, I've also added to this quote, if you ask why, it leads to despair. If you ask what, it leads to purpose. That in a nutshell is meekness. That's the type of humble, trusting faith that Jesus modeled for us. That's the gentle spirit that says, God, this doesn't make sense. God, I didn't want this. I still don't understand this. I may never will. But I know that you're in control and that you can bring good from this. 
And that's not to say we can never ask God why. That's not to say we can never be upset or angry or frustrated about the things going on in our lives. But after the wrestling, after we've wrestled it through with God, after we've thrown every question that we can imagine at him, do we come to the point of humbly saying, you are God and I am not. You are God, I trust you. May your will be done in this situation. And so either today in this moment or sometime later this week, be willing to ask yourself these questions to help gauge where you're at when it comes to the fruit of gentleness. Because as we've seen, gentleness is a key indicator that the Spirit is at work in your life. As we close our services together this morning, the worship teams in all of our venues are going to come. They're going to lead us in another song, singing to God. I'd encourage you to use this time to simply express your need for the Lord to express your need for the Holy Spirit to grow all of these fruits in your life, but particularly today, this fruit of gentleness. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the example of Jesus. We thank you for his gentleness, his level-headedness, his willing to be absolutely surrendered to your will above all others. We pray that today you would grow in us this fruit of gentleness. You would help us to surrender our our power, our anger, our energy, all to you so that you can channel it into good and useful work for your kingdom. Help us to be people who control our strength, who leverage it for other people, and who bow before you in humility. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.